Hi guys, Dr. Tim Cruz. This is Elementary Statistics. Um, today I'm going to show you how to find a confidence interval when you don't know your population standard deviation when sigma is unknown. All right, in this case we have to use what's called the t-table. So find a confidence interval for a population mean. So we're looking for mu. You know, mu is just something that we have to guess at. Uh, you know, by taking samples and just kind of guessing at what mu is. So I'm going to find a confidence interval. I'm going to kind of get about, give a range of numbers that mu will probably lie in between. And we don't know what the population standard deviation is. And so as a result, instead of using z, we're going to use t. All right. If we know what sigma is, we use the z-score. If, if we don't know what the population standard deviation is, we use the t-values. Uh, so we'll calculate a sample standard deviation. Now there is a previous video that says find the confidence intervals when you know sigma that has a, you know, a longer explanation of what a confidence interval is. So you might want to watch that first. All right, if we're asked to find a confidence interval and they don't tell us the population standard deviation, sigma, well then we have to use s, which is the same thing but for the sample. All right, the population is, you know, everybody. And we can't always measure everybody. Sometimes we have to just grab, you know, 10 or 20 or 100 people and measure them instead, our sample. All right. And then we kind of guess at what the population average would be and what the population standard deviation would be. So sometimes they go ahead and tell us what the population standard deviation is, and sometimes they don't. If they don't, we got to take a sample and find the standard deviation for the sample. Now, sometimes this is given. That makes the, the problem easy. And then sometimes we have to calculate it from a set of values. I'll show you both ways. But let's review where sample standard deviation comes from first. All right, here's a nice easy example about a, a basketball team. I have five players here. Those are my x values. And this is their height in inches. So this is six foot tall, 72 inches, six foot one, six foot three, six foot five and six foot six okay so five basketball players their average height is 75 inches i'll remind you how to calculate that all right and this is our sample let's find their standard deviation so this is kind of how you do it by hand all right we're going to do it on the calculator here in a minute but let's remember let's remember where standard deviation comes from by hand well first of all to find the average height we just add these guys up and divide them by five Here's the notation down here. So the average height we call x bar. Uh, sigma means add them all up. That means summation. So add up all the x's and divide by 5. Add up all the x's. It's 375 divided by 5. Tells us that our sample average or our average height for our sample, our sample mean, is 75. That's where the 75 came from. All right. Now some of these guys, since average is 75 inches, this guy is right at average. This guy is two inches below average. This guy is three inches below average. This guy is a little taller than average. He's two inches taller than average. And this guy is three inches taller than average. Well, these are basically your deviations. They are deviating from the average. This person deviates from average by three inches, negative three. This person deviates from average by three inches also, but it's positive three. He's three above, he's three below. These are our deviations. A standard deviation, more or less, is just the average deviation. So what I'm tempted to do is add these all up and divide by 5 to find my average deviation, my standard deviation. But look what, ha <clears throat> excuse me, look what happens when we do that. If I add all of those up, I get 0. And then when I do 0 divided by 5, well, that gives me 0. That's just not useful. All right, I tried to find the average deviation. I tried to add up all the deviations and divide by 5. Didn't work out because the negatives are messing with me. These negatives cancel out these positives, and we wind up at 0, which makes this not a useful calculation. So we use a little trick. To get rid of the negatives, we just square everything. So those, dip, those differences, those variations... I'm going to square each one, and what I get are positive numbers. So negative 3 times negative 3, positive 9. This squared is positive 4, and so on. So when I square each one, I end up with a bunch of positive numbers, which I can average these now. They don't add up to 0 anymore. So I can average these. 
and I have to make a small adjustment. All right, I'm tempted to add them up and divide by five, but for the actual formula, we have to divide by one less than our group number. So I have to divide by one less than five. I have to divide by four. So we're gonna add up all the squared deviations. That adds up to 26, which I'm tempted to divide by five, but I actually have to divide by four which gives me, it looks like, an average deviation of 6.5. All right, these were the deviations and we averaged them, kind of, and got 6.5. But remember, we made all these numbers too big. When you square three, it goes up to nine. When you square two, it goes up to four. We made all of these numbers bigger by squaring them. So this number that we got right here, it's too big. All right, remember it was squared. All those numbers were squared. So we're dealing with a number that's too big. So what we gotta do is we gotta unsquare them. All right, so the final step is undo that thing that you did and you undo squaring by square rooting. So take this number, this average that's too big and unsquare it or square root it to get the actual sample standard deviation, which we call S. So on this basketball team, I would say the average height is 75 inches, give or take 2.5 inches. That's my give or take, my sample standard deviation. All right, now luckily there's a, there's a quicker way to get there if we just use the graphing calculator. Or you can do it on Excel or a number of other programs. I'll let you Google how to do it on Excel. But if I want to calculate these numbers on the graphing calculator, I'm just going to do stat, edit, enter my values in list one, and then stat calculate and one variable statistics. I'll show you how that works. All right, so stat, let me get this organized here. All right, so I'm gonna press my stat button there. Let's turn it on first and stat. I'm gonna choose the first option, edit. I'm gonna put my values, my heights of my basketball players in list one. So I got my five heights in there. And now I'm going to tell it to calculate one variable statistics. So I'm going to hit stat again, go right to calculate. And that first option says one variable statistics. That's what I want. So I hit enter and uh, it says, OK, am I pulling the values from list one? Yes, we are. I don't have to mess with that. Don't mess with the frequency list and just tell it to calculate. And there's my X bar. My average height is 75. And this looks like a capital S. It's supposed to be lowercase. But that's my sample standard deviation for the x values of 2.549. Oh, also n equals 5. You're going to need that later. How many values did we put in the table? 5. All right, now one other thing we need to do before we can actually calculate a confidence interval is we need to learn how to find t values. All right, when you, when you know what sigma is, you just go look on your Z table and you find the Z scores that match your confidence interval you're looking for. With T values, it's kind of the same deal. A T distribution looks a lot like a standard normal curve. All right. I'm still going to find a negative T and a positive T that kind of fence in or bracket a 90% area. Uh, it's just a little trickier to do. So let's find the T values that bracket a 90% confidence interval. All right, now these T values, uh, they can change quite a bit. The T values for a 90% confidence interval can range from, well, at the table I'm looking at, they could be as low as 1.646. So like this could be negative 1.646, 1 and this could be positive 1.646. But it could range to as high as, on my table, it goes as high as 6.314 for a 90% confidence level. So. This could technically be negative 6.314, six steps to the left. And this could be positive 6.314, six steps to the right. So you see there's quite a, a bit of range there for a 90% confidence interval. So what does it depend on? Uh, what it depends on is how big a group you sampled. How many people did you survey? How many things did you measure? All right. So the bigger the group, uh, the more it changes T what T value you're looking for. More specifically, we need to find degrees of freedom, which is actually one less than how big your group is. So if you have a group of 10, your degrees of freedom is actually going to be one less than 10. It'll be nine. 
a group of 20 will have 19 degrees of freedom and so on. Now why? Um, if you care, this part's optional, just extra information. All right, degrees of freedom, uh, we abbreviate it DF, is the number of values that are kind of free to roam or free to vary. For example, uh, if I tell you X bar equals 10, if I tell you the average is 10, well, it could be a lot of different values. This group of three here, nine plus 10 plus 11, that's 30 divided by three is 10. That has an average of 10. So does eight, 10, 12. Add them up, divide by three, that's an average of 10. So does seven, 10, 13. So does six, four, six, 10, 14. Now, the first two values can be anything you want, all right? It can be nine and 10, or it can be eight and 10, or it can be seven and 10. It can be anything you want. Now, the 10 stayed the same, but that's just because I'm trying to make a point. You can pick any two numbers for the first two numbers. You're free to choose any two numbers. They're free to vary. It can vary from 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 and so on. But once you pick those first two numbers, let's say I pick 6 and 10. Well, now I don't have a choice about the third number. I have to force this number to be whatever it needs to be so that they add up to 30 and then divide by 3 gives us 10. So this number is fixed. The first two you can pick 7 and 10, 9 and 10, you know, whatever you want. But the third number has to make the average equal 10. So the third number doesn't really have any choice. It's a fixed value. So for example, on our 90% confidence interval, if I have a group of five, well, that means my degrees of freedom is one less, it's four. Well, for a degree of freedom of four, our T values would go from negative 2.132 all the way to positive 2.132. So it'd be like a little more than two steps to the left and a little bit more than two steps to the right. But if I have a bigger group there, if I have a group of 10 with a degree of freedom nine, one less than your group, a 90% confidence interval would only go from negative 1.833 to positive 1.833. So it'd be like 1.8 steps to the left and 1.8 steps to the right. It'd be a little bit narrower. And if I raise the group to 21, well, that means degrees of freedom would be one less. That'd be a, uh, degrees of freedom 20. Well, that narrows my brackets or my fence. It narrows my fence a little more. Now it's only 1.7 steps to the left and 1.7 steps to the right. All right. So you can kind of see the, the fence. If I call this a fence or a boundary or a bracket, you can see the fence kind of moving in as our N increases. All right, let's start with an easy problem. Let's go ahead and calculate a confidence interval now. And let's say that they just give us S, but they just go ahead and hand us the sample standard deviation. What's the average cost of a sleeping bag? Now, if they're talking about the true average cost of any sleeping bag anywhere, they're talking about mu. All right, so we're going to kind of guess at mu. I can't afford to go out and check every sleeping bag in every store in every country in the world. All right. Whatever that is, if I add all those up and divide by how many there are, that's mu. It's something that we'll really never be able to calculate. But we're going to kind of guess at it by taking a few samples. And when we take a few samples, we kind of guess that mu must be between these two numbers. We kind of create a range of prices that it could be in between. So let's say we sampled 20 sleeping bags, and the average cost of these 20, the sample, which we call x bar, the average cost of those 20 sleeping bags was about $82.90 a piece. All right, with a standard deviation, they're just going to go ahead and give it to us. They're going to tell us what S is. It's 32.7718. So they're saying the average sleeping bag in my sample is $82.90, um, give or take $32.77. Right, so there's a range. Find a 90% confidence interval. For the true, the true average cost of a sleeping bag, what we found here was just the average cost for our sample, for those 20 bags we looked at. That's not very many, all right? So we found an average, but it's just for our sample. Now we're going to use this to kind of guess at what the true average cost of any sleeping bag anywhere would be. And I want to say it with 90% confidence. That means I want to be pretty sure. So I want to create a range of values that I can be 90% sure that mu, the true actual cost of a sleeping bag, 
will lie between these two dollar figures that we come up with. All right, first thing is to get organized. So I, I always like to start with a sketch. So I'm going to start with a sketch here, and I'm going to put 90% in the middle. Now hold off on your, your fences, your brackets here, because you don't exactly know where they are yet. They could be two steps to the left, or they could just be 1.7 steps to the left. You don't really know yet, but go ahead and put your 90% here. And then let's organize our information. I always start with how many. We uh, looked at 20 sleeping bags. Now, what's mu? What's the true cost of a, a sleeping bag anywhere in the world? We don't know. We're going to kind of guess at it. And they didn't give us this. This is important. They didn't give us population standard deviation. So we don't know the true average cost. And we don't know the give or take. We don't know the population standard deviation. When we don't know sigma, that tells us that we have to use the T table and not the Z table. All right, for our sample, the sample average is $82.90, give or take, that's sample standard deviation, give or take $32.0.7718. The confidence level they told us to use is 90%, so they want us to bracket 90% of the curve. i got to figure out where to put these two lines so that it holds 90% of the curve. Now what T number am I going to use? I want the T number that's appropriate for this confidence level. That means I want the T number that's associated with 90%. All right, I'm going to show you how to look this up. It's going to be 1.729. Let me grab the T table. All right, so this is the T table that I'm using. And I'm going to use uh, degrees of freedom here on the left. So you see D period F period. That's degrees of freedom. That's the numbers on the left. And then we're going to use C, our confidence level, in this third row of numbers up here. The one-tail area, two-tail area, we use that for hypothesis testing later. Right now, we're just kind of dealing with this curve right here, this distribution curve, a T distribution curve. And we're trying to figure out what these T numbers are for a specific area. In this case, we're looking for 90%. All right. So confidence level, as I scroll to the right, I'm looking for 90%. There it is right there, 0 0.90. That's 90% confidence. And then I got to remember what my group size was. Uh, it was 20 sleeping bags, which is a confident, which is a degree of freedom of 19. There's 19 right there. So degree of freedom 19, 90% confidence level. See where they meet. It's right there at 1.729. So they're saying in this particular instance, if your degrees of freedom are 19, which means you had a group of 20, in this particular in instance you would shade from 1.729 to the left all the way to 1.729 to the right. You would shade that area and that would be 90% of the curve, leaving 10% on, oops, sorry, 5% on the left and 5% on the right for a total of 100%. But that leaves 90% in the middle. But notice how it changes, all right? Notice how 90% changes depending on the group size. If I had a group of 16, which would be degrees of freedom 15, now it's 1.753 either way. If I had a group of 11, which means degrees of freedom 10, now it's 1.812 steps either way, left and right, and so on. So notice that your, your bracket numbers, your T numbers, they change. It's still going to be 90%. It's still going to enclose 90% of the curve, but they kind of move left and right depending on how big your group is, on how big your degrees of freedom are. All right, so we looked up in the T-table that for a 90% uh, confidence level with a group of 20, which means degrees of freedom 19, that means we have to shade from both of the 1.729s. I need to shade from 1.729 steps to the left. Negative means left. 1.729 steps to the right. I need to shade in between there and that will shade 90% of the curve for this group of 20. All right, so I know that mu, you know, that mythical, that mythological number, the true cost of a sleeping bag anywhere in the world, I know that mu is between these two numbers if I'm speaking this language over here, if I'm speaking T, all right? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't want to speak T. I want to speak dollars, all right? Dollars is X. X is your story problem numbers, and my story is talking about dollars. So I want to change these T numbers 
from negative 1.729 to 1.729, I want to change these or convert these to my story problem numbers, which are my x values, my, my real life values. So I know that mu is between the 1.729s, but what would mu be between if I was speaking in dollars and cents, like the story problem is? Well, I just got to do a little conversion here. Grab my formula here. I know that mu is between my average, all right, what I think. Let me get uh, lined up here. There we go. All right, I know that mu is between what I think it is. I think the average cost of a sleeping bag is 82.90. I mean, that's what my sample was. And I think that's what mu is. That's what we're kind of guessing at. Based on my sample of only 20 bags, I'm guessing that mu anywhere in the world, the average cost of a sleeping bag would be about $82.90. We'll never know for sure, but we're going to take some samples and kind of guess at it. So I think that mu is 82.90, but I want you to give or take, plus means give, minus means take, I want you to give or take a little bit of error. We call that margin of error. It's kind of like insurance. I want you to give me a little insurance. I'm pretty sure it's 82.90, but I want you to give or take a little bit of insurance, a little bit of margin of error. We have a nice formula for that right here. So it's x bar. I'll work on the right side over here. It's x bar plus uh, your t number for that particular confidence level for that particular group times your sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the group size. Now remember, this is n, all right? This is the original 20 bags. It's not going to be degrees of freedom. It's going to be n. And work out the same thing over here, only it's minus. Now plug in numbers. Notice that I, I keep it pretty exact when I'm in the, the, the middle of my calculations. You know, if I have a choice about how far to go on the decimal, I usually go at least four decimal places. More is better. The more numbers you use, the more accurate your answer will be. But if you go at least one, two, three, four numbers past the decimal, you're going to be pretty darn close and you'll get the answer right almost every single time. So X bar, the average for my sample, my average sleeping bag was $82.90 minus the T number for that 90% confidence level, which we looked it up in the table, and it's 1.729. Now don't worry about negative or positive. The minus and the plus will take care of that. Just write down 1.729 where it goes. Sample standard deviation, which they gave us, was give or take $32.77. I made it a little more accurate, divided by the square root of n. So that's the actual 20 bags. It's not, it's not the 19 degrees of freedom. Same thing over here, but with plus. Now this is kind of an extra line here. Uh, I went ahead and I just wanted to show you what the, like that insurance was, that little extra give or take, that margin of error. So I went ahead and just worked this out separately. Usually I just plug the whole thing in, just do it all at once. But on this example here, I worked out the margin of error separately just to kind of show you that we're asking for a little bit of insurance of $12.67. So we're saying, what is the true average cost of a sleeping bag anywhere in the world? Well, I don't know. You know, we'll never know because we're never going to be able to gather up all those sleeping bags. But I think that that true average cost lies in between $82.90 plus 1267 and 82 to 8290 minus 1267. I'm saying that I think mu is 8290 give or take $12.67. So it might be $12.67 lower, it might be $12.67 higher, but it's somewhere in between there. It's just kind of an educated guess is what we're making. So that works out to I think the true average cost of a sleeping bag anywhere in the world is somewhere between $70.23 and $95.57. I can say that with 90% confidence. All right, I'm 90% confident that if you go anywhere in the world, the average cost of the sleeping bag will be between these two numbers. All right, I want to do the same problem, but I, don't, I want to show you what it would look like if they did not give you S if they did not give you the sample standard deviation. So let's do it again, but this time <clears throat> I'll just give you 20 sample values. I'll give you the price of 20 separate sleeping bags, and then you can calculate X bar and S. 
So here's what the problem would look like if they did not give you S. What's the true average cost of a sleeping bag? Remember, that's mu. Below is a random sample of prices for sleeping bags. Here they are right here. Find a 90% confidence interval for the true average cost, that's mu, of a sleeping bag. So we have 20 prices of sleeping bags here, $115, $65, $35, and so on. All right, this, I need to calculate uh, my X bar and my S. Now we can do it the long way by hand, like we did the basketball team at the first. But it's quicker if you just grab your calculator and do it. So let's get organized here. All right, so I'm just kind of organizing my data. I always start with how many, and this is in your calculator as well. It'll tell you you have 20 values, which means degrees of freedom is one less, 19. They did not tell us what mu is. That's the question. They're saying, hey, what do you think the average cost of a sleeping bag is? I don't know, but we're going to kind of guess at it. Uh, and they didn't give us the population standard deviation. So when they don't give you sigma, that automatically tells you to use the t-table. Now these guys here we calculated in our calculator. Okay, so grab your calculator and uh, stat, edit. Go ahead and put your 20 prices of your sleeping bags and list one. And then we go stat, calculate. And I want option one, I want one variable statistics. And it says, is your data in list one? Yes, it is. I'm going to skip on past that down to calculate. And there it says, okay, you got 20 values. N equals 20. That's right there. And the average of your sample, the average of your 20 bags is 8290. That's right there. And I kind of overdid it and went four decimal places just to show you. Always go four decimals past the, or four places past the decimal if you can. The more numbers you use, the more accurate your answer will be. But as a habit, I always go at least four decimal places. And then my sample standard deviation is 32.7718, rounds up to an eight. And you can use more if you want to, but four decimal places usually gets the job done. All right, our confidence level is 90%. Now the T number associated with that confidence level of 0.90 is, remember it's degrees of freedom, so you're going to grab your t-table, you're going to find 19 degrees of freedom, you're going to find 90% confidence level, and they're going to meet at 1.729. All right, and then we can stop there because the confidence interval is going to be calculated the same as we just did. Okay, so now I want you to try one. All right, so this is our last problem today. You try this one. What's the average startup cost, mu, of a candy store. So they're talking about any candy store anywhere in the world. You know, that's mu. All right? There's no way we're going to be able to figure that out because I can't go to every candy store in the world and figure out what the startup cost was for each one and add them all up and divide by how many there were. That's mu. It's out there somewhere, but we'll never know what it is. What we're going to do instead is just kind of guess at it by taking a sample and using our sample to kind of give a range of values that mu might be between. So below is a random sample of startup costs, and we're speaking in thousands of dollars. So 93 means $93,000, 171 means $171,000, and so on. Find a 90% confidence interval for the population average startup cost, mu, for a candy store franchise. All right, you guys go ahead and pause the video and work it like we just did the last one. All right, so hopefully you paused the video. Let's get organized here. Okay. All right, so I know that I have 90% confidence level. That means from here to here. Now I'm not quite sure what those numbers are yet, so hold off on drawing your fences until you figure out exactly what that number is, because you want to put the T number in an appropriate place. Like, you know, if it's two something, if it's two point something, I want to make sure that I'm more than two steps to the right and more than two steps to the left. So I've kind of cheated and already drawn it in here, but go when you guys are doing it, write your 90% here in the middle and then go find your T number. But let me go over the information. We have nine values, which means degrees of freedom is one less. 
Uh, the population average is unknown. I don't know what the average startup cost is for a candy store. They didn't give us the population standard deviation either, which means use the t-table. Now I popped in those nine into my calculator, and I hit stat, calculate, one variable statistics, and it told me n is nine, x bar is 107.2222, and give or take 28.9904. So they're telling us, on average, it costs about $107,000 to start a candy store, uh, give or take $28,000, roughly. All right, I guess that would round up to $29,000. So it takes, on average, $107,000 to start a candy store, give or take $29,000. We need a 90% confidence level, so I need the T number for a 90% confidence level. So I'm going to look at 90% confidence level. And I'm going to look at 8 degrees of freedom. 90% confidence level. And I'm going to follow it down to 8 degrees of freedom. That's 1.860 either way. So 1.86 to the right and 1.86 to the left. All right, so let's talk through. We know that... The true startup cost of any candy store anywhere in the world is somewhere between negative 1.86 steps to the right and 1.86, oops, I said that backwards, 1.86 steps to the left and 1.86 steps to the right. So the true startup cost is somewhere in between there. But that's if we're speaking this T language, all right? It doesn't make much sense to us. We need to change this to our X language, all right, we're talking in thousands of dollars. So I need to change these 1.86 numbers to numbers that make sense to our story. All right, so using our little formula here, we know that mu lies somewhere between the average that we took, those candy stores that we averaged, plus or minus a little bit of insurance, a little bit of margin of error. So I want to know what mu lies in between when I'm speaking in thousands of dollars. Uh, here's the official formula. It's your sample average plus that T number for your confidence level. That's going to be our 1.86 times the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of, remember how many you sampled. All right, here's what it looks like. My sample average of those candy stores was 107.2222 plus the T number for that confidence level, 1.860 times the sample standard deviation. We said average startup was 107, give or take 29. So that's our give or take number. Divided by square root of nine. We uh, checked out nine startups. Gives us a guess, an estimate, that mu, the startup cost for any candy store anywhere in the world, is probably between $89.248,000 and $125,196,000. That's the best we can do is just kind of guess at it because there's no way we can visit every candy store in the world and calculate their average startup cost. So what we do is we take a sample and we use that sample to guess at what the true population average startup cost of a candy store would lie between. So we can say with 90% confidence that the true average lies between these two numbers. All right, that's it, guys.